Hi, I'm certified financial planner Kathleen Nemitz, and this is the show Women on Money. This show is produced for women, by women, on topics that women care about. Money is one of those topics as it touches many aspects of our lives. Today we are here to talk about business capital, that is, finding money to scale a business from idea to positive cash flow and growth. With me are investment consultant Kim Casalonius of Breakaway Funding, Serafina Palandek of Hip Chick Farms, and attorney Tulasi Hussain. Uh, welcome, ladies. Mm -hmm. Ladies, let's start with some framework. Our focus here is how to scale a business with cash flow or outside finances. A business may start small, but potentially grow to employ many people and serve many customers. Our show today will use the example of such a company which has succeeded in using cash flow and financing to grow. We'll be aiming this discussion at business owners rather than other parties. Let's start with a short video visit to Hipchick Farms in Sebastopol. Nemitz here for Marin Community Television in downtown Sebastopol. We're about to visit with the CEO of Hipchick Farms, Serafina Palandish. My name is Serafina Palandek and welcome to Hipchick Farms' kitchen. Um, today I'm going to tell you a little bit about Hipchick Farms. We started five years ago as a frozen food company. Uh, so we have a line of 100% organic, non-GMO and humanely certified chicken fingers, chicken meatballs, breakfast sausages and turkey patties that are sold into over 5,000 retailers across the country. So, um, here are some of the wonderful dishes that Chef Jen makes at the kitchen. Um, our flight of chicken fingers, you can taste a variety of different chicken fingers here, and our wonderful brought fried buttermilk chicken sandwich, it's delicious. So we opened the kitchen as an innovation vehicle for Chef Jen to test and develop new products. Uh, it's also been a fantastic fast casual concept that seems to resonate with our community and it's a wonderful marketing tool for us. This year actually we've, our revenues have grown over 300% and that kind of growth requires um, a significant amount of equity um, uh, equity injection into the company. So I have raised a lot of capital through a variety of means. So some of the things we've done, uh, we have taken out a loan. When we were just starting, we took out a loan with the SBA. We did a uh, Kickstarter campaign way back in the day. We did a friends and family round of uh, selling common stock. We did a convertible note on Circle Up. And this year we closed our first Series A uh, for three and a half million dollars with Advantage Capital. I think when we're talking about businesses, there are really about five different stages of a business growth, right? So you've got the idea stage, you've got the seed stage, where the company has maybe gone to some friends and family and got some capital to get the product out the door, to get a prototype of the product, and you've got your kind of post-seed stage where you're, you're looking for additional capital to grow and scale the company at gr much greater velocity. And then you've got, of course, your mature companies that are expanding and going to need capital at that point um, as well. So I, really, when we're talking about growth of companies, there are really about four or five different stages of a company. And each of those stages are attractive to different types of investors and different uh, capital sources. Uh, what kind of risk does one take on when we start thinking about sources of capital and how to manage that? There's always the fear of losing control, for instance. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that a real concern? Well, and of yeah. course, with debt, it's, a lot of times you are doing personal guarantees, you know, suppose in a bank loan. So yes, you are risking losing maybe your home or whatever else you're using for collateral. In the context of equity, you could 
you know, technically, depending on the type of investment, be pushed out as the as the founder and have yourself replaced by you know someone else as the CEO again, depending how much uh, control you've given over to the. But there's also a reward. Investor. That's yes. why people might yes. want to go there. Yes. And Kim, you were talking a little bit about uh, uh, women shying away from risk, but maybe they're not they're not thinking about that reward. I know um, entrepreneurship runs in your family. Maybe you should talk a little bit about your mom. And the, well, your the, that's a there. long conversation. Okay. Although she's been a terrific mentor and a, a great role model. Founder of a bank. Uh, founder of that. Okay. several banks. One of the first female CEO, um, stockbrokers, actually, in, in the state of California. So she's got a long history of pushing the envelope. But I, but I think it's right. And I think that women, by and large, we have so much skill. But for whatever reason, we don't want to take the risk or we're reluctant to take the risk to, to achieve our dreams, whether it's being the best CEO. We can be, you talked a little bit earlier about you know, making mistakes. And we don't like to make mistakes. We don't want, we don't want, to, be we don't want, we don't want to be wrong. We don't want to be people to see us as fallible, right? Mm -hmm. But we have to get comfortable with making mistakes and, and being OK with who we are. So. I know, uh, Sarah Finney, you've got, you were sharing with us earlier, and I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more from your perspective. I have never thought, had the thought that we would fail. And so because of that, I have been willing to risk everything. I've risked my personal career, right, um, doing something I've never done before. We, have, we took out an SBA loan, and, we, literally, and we, we took out a second mortgage on our house, you know, I'm married to my business partner, so there's a lot of child. Right there, child. <laughs> so there's a lot of risk there. But you know, the, the, one of the things that we had talked about briefly that resonates for me is that I want my daughter to, to. I want her to model her behavior on my behavior. So I'm willing to do those scary things because I want that kid to be stronger than I am. And yes. I think what's really important also for women is not only to know that they are capable and are invited to be whatever they want to be and to do what they want to do, also do, but it's OK to fail. And yes. also, it it's is okay hard yes. to fail. Yes. I think we've all said it's hard because it is hard, right? Yes. That it's hard to raise, to, to, to sell your business or you sell your idea to another group of people because it's hard. It's hard. It's not because of your gender. It's hard. Yes. And you have to just. Get it down and, and work with uh, uh, trusted advisors you to have, have the skin. right message and the right accounting and the right idea and vet your business plan. And keep going when it gets tough. But the passion can help push through the, the fear, the, the resiliency of being knocked down or being tired. So I think really from an entrepreneur's perspective, there are a lot of tools that we have, a lot of um, emotional tools and, of course, support from each other that can help us get through those little bumps in the road or the roadblocks or the rejection setbacks. or the setbacks. So we could talk about organic growth, too, because, of, for instance, I'm aware of, of family-owned companies that may want to change plans. Maybe uh, the adult children are now running the company and they have a new objective for what they want to do. So. How would you classify a company like that? Well, I guess it would depend. You know, some companies maybe have plateaued if they've been around for 20 years. Maybe they've had some um, solid growth over time, and, and they're just looking to, to get to that next plateau. And so I would say it really just depends upon really what has the, the historical trend of the company's revenues look like so we could determine whether or not you know, it's still growing exponentially or is it kind of plateaued. So there's an organic process and an evolutionary process for businesses. What would be some of the significant milestones for a company that wants to move from an idea to fruition? So we, um, for instance, choice of entity. How do, what kind of company am I going to be? So who would, who would uh, an entrepreneur need to see to define what would be the appropriate entity choice? Maybe two let's see, do you want to take that one on? Yeah, I mean, I think. Uh, it depends on the type of business the client is trying to form. So it could either be an attorney or an accountant. And from an accounting standpoint, of course, there are a lot of different tax consequences depending on the structure of the entity and as well as uh, you know liability issues, which I guess attorneys tend to address. 
Uh, it also depends, I think, what the long-range plan of the company is, meaning if you are a company, let's say, as I tend to represent, you know, more tech companies that are looking for, you know, funding at some point from, So you, you have, know, a, for instance, this. your client might be an entrepreneur with an idea, an inventor. Yes. And, and they, want to, they want to produce, they want to create a yeah. production of, of a their, device. Yeah, and then they need funding for that or they're expecting to grow either hoping for an IPO or hoping to be acquired. But the fact is there are certain structures, depending on who the investor is, that it would make uh, more sense to be, let's say, a C corporation versus an S corporation versus an LLC. But you have to look at really the overall objective of what the client is trying to achieve before Within selecting. a defined period of time, perhaps maybe it's five years, ten years, yes, yeah, you know, six months. I think one of the interesting pieces of advice I got when we started was um, some very wise gentleman has told me that I really needed to know that myself and, and my partner, Jen, we needed to know as a family what our end goal was, what our end game was, and whether we wanted to start by, you know, whether we wanted it to be a small family business that remained in family hands and grew small organically, we'll call it the farmer's market model, or whether we wanted something else. And we knew very clearly that we wanted to grow very quickly, very aggressively, and then we ultimately wanted to be acquired, right? So that modeling then affected, I mean, it also goes into how much risk you're willing to take, like how risk adverse are you, you know, because mm -hmm. it's a big gamble to go that route um, from your personal finances as well from a, from a um, business finance perspective. Um, but that really advised us on how we were going to go in terms of what entity we set up. So you got a blueprint. You had a blueprint in mind, and you started to vet it with experts at some point. And then yeah. and who did you see? Who, I mean, who were some of the people you brought into your circle? Oh, gosh. Well, um, I... Um, I really believe that um, this community, um, the natural and organic food community, um, but people in general are just kind. And there is a lot of opportunity for people to help each other and to, for us all to lift each other up. So I reached out to local um, entrepreneurship, like the, um, the SBA, the SBDC, the Small Business Development Center, um, SCORE, the Society of Retired uh, Entrepreneurs. They taught me a bunch. Um, and then I... Uh, literally would call businesses that I admired and ask them for help. You know? For mentoring. For mentoring, absolutely. And I got all kinds of mentors and advisors, um, wonderful women. And then you had to women. choose, a, do you have a board? Um, we do. The board came later. Oh, that uh, came later. The board came okay. later. So um, that was actually very much driven by the, invest the investors. Rather, um, we gained some really amazing investors, and they joined our board, and that's been an evolutionary process as well. Um, but I reached out to everybody I could think of and asked for help, and, and lots of wonderful women helped me. So, Kim, when you're counseling companies that, that are coming to that fork in the road, maybe they've self-financed. They could even be, like I said, a family-run business that may already uh, have been in existence for 20 years. And they're trying to make a decision how now to structure for expansion. How do you begin to guide them? Well, I think I want to kind of ping off what Serafina was saying, and that is really, do you, what do you want at the end of the day? Because the type, the type of capital that you take and the amount of capital that you take could result in two different ownership structures at the end of the day. So really, it's a, a conversation in terms of where do you see the vision of the company? What is your exit strategy? Do you want to? maybe sell to your children? Are you looking to sell to an outsider? And once you've had those um, discussions and the owners have made some decisions, then you can really talk about what is the best capital structure fit, right? Is it debt? Is it going to come from a financial institution? Or is it equity? Are we going to be looking for outside partners to come in? Or is it going to be a combination of both, right? So it's really, it's more of an iterative process than it is that you know, one size fits all. I mean, business owners have a lot of choices in terms of how they might want to structure the capital that best fits that particular business model and the ultimate financial goals of the, of the founders. But I would also say that it also has to be somewhat opportunistic, right? Because it's not necessarily a founder's choice to select from the menu of what the opportunities are, right? Like, we have to be aggressive in terms of what we go after. And 
be somewhat nimble in terms of like what opportunities present themselves because it is hard to raise money. Indeed. Right? Indeed. It's really hard to raise money and it's really hard to borrow money. It might even be more difficult and I'd love to hear your feedback on that. Well, let, me, like, let me interject something because I, I think it's important to preface this discussion with the fact that what we're discussing here today is to educate. The reason that we're here today is to educate and to inform. And then so if the viewer listening to this wants to take action, please seek outside counsel. Please um, ask the opinion of experts Absolutely. who can guide you and then uh, determine if indeed there's a fit for you. But we're not here to address necessarily uh, would-be investors today. We're here to uh, address business owners. So with that said, I want to encourage you to, to build on what you were just saying. But I felt that we needed to interject that a bit. Sure. Okay. Well, I think uh, to, to go to your to maybe add on, and, and as the attorney on the on the panel, perhaps you can weigh in on this. It is true. At capital raising is difficult. It is, I think it doesn't matter really where you are. Certainly, if you're in the later stage and you've got recurring revenue that's solid, mm -hmm. your options you have a lot more options. Mm -hmm. But as you're in this growth mode. You know, we talked about the early stages. Are you pre-stage? Are you expansion? You are going to, your company is going to be more attractive to certain types of investors and you will be eligible or you will qualify for certain types of uh, capital just depending upon what, does, what is the financial profile of your company at that time. So I'm absolutely with you, I think, and particularly for women. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of statistics out there about women and borrowing money, and we don't. We don't maybe we talked about this a little bit earlier, before the before this uh, conversation about women just don't apply for bank loans as at the rate that men do because we don't like to get turned down, right? Mm -hmm. Right, and we're just we're not as comfortable applying for bank loans. So I think as women, we have to be aggressive. And no matter how uh, who we're going to um, be seeking capital after, I just have to you know, no just means no for today, and that just means no for you. But yeah. maybe it's going to oh. be yes from you tomorrow. Yeah, right? I've certainly yes. been told no in more ways, shapes, and forms than I thought humanly possible. Uh, you know, I've pitched something like 300 times and been told 299. Right? It just takes that one yes. So just yes. keep going. And that stamina and resilience factor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, I, I agree because I do think it depends on the size of the company in terms of the type of investor you get and who you're going to go after. And it's true. I mean, the reality is early stage companies, they usually have no cash. So it makes it hard to raise that money. And you do have, you know, it's, it's, there's disclosure obligations, which you are bound to. And trade yeah, secret, non-disclosure contracts, you may yes. want to ask uh, potential people. Uh, potential investors to sign so yes. that they're not releasing your trade secrets. Exactly. So yes, I mean, you, you would have a non-disclosure agreement before you um, made your company information available, especially um, with tech companies more so. I think they're used to having a creditor investors looking at them. Uh, I mean, once you get past the family and friend stage to some extent, I think they all have to bootstrap at the early stage. but. I think the reality is when you are uh, opening your books, because um, they will have more detailed questions because they're sophisticated investors. Um, and the fact is, you don't want them taking your trade secrets and using it in some other investment that they are considering. So. I think that I mean I think it's a really interesting point you made that we don't that women don't ask for money mm -hmm. uh, or borrow money as much. Uh, and I think that this process for going out and talking to folks over and over and over again and being asked really hard questions has made me a much better CEO. As horrifying as it's been at times, I have the capacity to, to grow. You know, there's certain things we're all good at. I, there's certain things I'm good at. There's certain things I'm not good at. And, uh, and this process has made me better at the things I'm not good at. Or, back to your getting, get professional help, it's made me find the right people who can help me or teach me so I can grow in the, into the process. I mean, just every time I pitch, it's a different pitch because I've learned more from the last time. What about um, just building the brand? When I say brand, brand is a relationship customers have with the company. So, and it's the reason they may buy. They, they associate whatever that product is, whatever that service is, with good things. They're getting, they feel it's worth whatever money they're putting on the table to buy it. 
And then the more people you have like that, the more valuable your company. So that's part of the, I would imagine, creating the investor appeal or just um, building um, your revenue base as a company. When we closed our Series A, our investor group uh, did a diligence report on us where they went out and interviewed every one of our customers. And uh, the report came back saying, well, look, we love Serafina. Like, you know, we, lo we, we love her product, but we really love her, right? And, uh, and there is a certain amount of, you know, um, it's, it's all about relationships, right? So if you can build these relationships, then the brand, there is going to be so many bumps in the road and so many, I made so, I have made so many mistakes and I per, I'm sure I will continue to make a million mistakes. Um, so if you have built those relationships and created a brand that's, um, you know, built on that foundation of good relationships and transparency and trust, trust, right, they trust you. and um, having good processes and knowing that like, everything she says is true and she can document it in all of these ways, then that's gonna you know, help carry the brand as you kind of go through these ups and downs of like, yeah. you know. And whatever. also I think the trust issue comes into play in terms of how quickly you disclose. So when things go wrong, the faster you get that information out, especially to your investors, it, it really does help reinforce the trust because you're going to meet them at some point, especially at this early stage when you know, hopefully the investor relationship is, um, you know, strategic so that they actually can help you out, but they need to be informed of what's going on in well, that case. And I would also add to that, you know, to the extent that you are transparent and you're disclosing, yeah. you can help to mitigate future lawsuits, yeah. right, about Correct. from disgruntled investors who said, well, you didn't tell me. If you would have told yeah. me or you would have, you know, we would have helped you or whatever yes. they're going to say. So yes. I think it's... It's just good business practice to, to be transparent. And, and art of brand is also intellectual property and trade secrets. So how does one protect that? Uh, and I'm, that's yes. a question that any lender, any outside party would ask, is how well protected is that? Or, or can somebody just duplicate what you've done? And so maybe you could speak to that a little bit. Uh, well, see. in terms of the brand, you would use you know, trademarks mm -hmm. to protect. If there's certain things you can do in terms of your processes, in terms of trade secrets, uh, obviously, you know, that is there as well. Um, I mean, the food companies do have trade. I mean, if you think about the famous ones, obviously, like Coca-Cola, they have a trade secret on how to make that perfect taste of Coke. But, but really, it is the brand. I mean, in terms of what that image invokes and what the feeling of the public may have towards your uh, product. And I think that uh, apart from the legal protection, meaning just getting the trademark filed and doing, um, taking the steps to ensure its, its protection and that its name is uh, respected, you know, it, especially with social media now, it's, it, there's, there's a certain aspect where um, you want to invite commentary, but you have to also manage that manage because you, you because it can be manage the persona yes in yeah the so so yeah and and i think that um is a little bit of an evolving area because i don't think the law is necessarily um that clear but i also think in some ways um you know the law tends to be behind on some things and and this is more a social um relationship that you're trying to cultivate in terms of who you are, you know, in terms of your persona, in terms of, and, and in a sense, the brand is you. So it's really, anyway, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, exactly. Let's hope not forever. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and this would so, exist whether, it, whether one is selling business to consumer or business to business. It's the right. same kind of issue. Yes. There is still is a brand, there's still a following, there's a relationship with the client. There's protection necessary for the product or service so that a co competition can't just walk off with the same idea, right? Yes. What about metrics for success and success thresholds? What does success look like at different life stages of a business? What do you think? We all, we all have an opinion on this. Yeah, I think, it's, I think it is individual. I, th I think that investors have a different lens through which they're going to measure uh, metric success. And I, and I think that that may or may not coincide with what the founders believe that there is success. So you're dealing with capital right now, so 
perhaps you'd like to share with us how your investors are, are viewing success. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, where we're at in our life cycle is we have grown into a national brand, and we're seeking to um, fill. We're going. We're going up against some significant competition, um, and we're starting to be a recognized as a player within the that set. Um, so we recognize success by the top line growth, really. Um, that is really what we're, we're focused on. That's because your end game is to be acquired, and that's the most important metric to realization of mm -hmm. that goal. Mm -hmm. And I think some of our capital sources are also looking at that metrics as a as a valuation mm -hmm. um, tool, right? In terms of how much capital Absolutely. they're willing to invest in you based upon how much revenue you can grow. Yeah, and and our personal end goal has to do with. Um, providing organic to the 99 percent so that is why organic we're so food organic to, food so to, to, so that it's available to every person the across the across the globe that's how we see the ability to affect change on a large scale is by utilizing a very um, a product that everybody loves and it's very almost pedestrian is like that's how we can affect the greatest amount of change as quickly as possible and then also on the back end affect or organic agriculture in our country is creating is by creating that effect, you know um, demand so you have a partnership with the producers that provide the chicken Absolutely. for instance for your yeah. your products yeah. yeah yeah so so i think that i think that we're, we're an ethically and mission driven company and we are a fiscally driven company, and I think that that is something that I don't want to shy away from as a woman, that we intend, have every intention of great fiscal success, right? So um, putting our mission first while having a parallel with a, success, with a good margin, right? So like, how do you make both of those things work? It's really interesting to That's me. That's fabulous. Well, I think going back to the goals, the, the goals and success are going to change as the company uh, moves through its evolution of growth. So maybe the first goal is to get paying customers. Yes. And the next goal yes. is to get, you know, to break even. And cash then flow. the next, right, the next, and cash flow. And then the next goal is, you know, fill in the blank. So I think that the goals are going to be constantly changing as the company evolves over time. Great. Nail it. And make it simple so people can can capture that and, and think about that as they're formulating their business plans and deciding who do they need to involve in their inner circle to make all of this happen. This closes our edition of Women on Money for today. The subject of business capital is a large one and there are many resources available to business owners who seek expansion. See you soon with another panel discussion focused on sharing wisdom about money.